Good afternoon, um, East Coast Central Time, Mountain Time attendees, and good morning to our West Coast attendees. Magandang hapon at magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. And mabuhay, uh, mabuhay to all of you, Filipino-American brothers and sisters. We all need mabuhay during this time. So let us say mabuhay to everybody, even though it's online, mabuhay. We are streaming live through the Blue Jeans platform and on the Facebook Live um, on, on, the, on Facebook Live on the Philippine Consulate General in New York Facebook page. Please share the consulate Facebook page, PHL in New York or PHL I N N Y. Please uh, share that to your networks and to our Kababayans who are not able to join us in Blue Jeans. We are joined again today by Consul General Claro Cristobal of the Philippine Consulate General in New York. He will say a few words in a few minutes. Thank you again, Ambassador, for your support of the Philom Health Forum. According to the Consul General, we were viewed by over 18,000 people on the Consulate's Facebook page from Spain to the Middle East even the Philippines and across the United States. And I'm Dr. Romel Rivera, the president of the Association of Philippine Physicians in America, or APPA, one of the organizers of the Filipino American Health Forum. I am based here in the outskirts of Philadelphia. It is 70 degrees here in Philadelphia and sunny. Mental health is near and dear to me working as a physician and as a psychiatrist for many years. Now more than ever in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to strengthen not just our physical health, but also our mental health. As we have not yet reached the end of the pandemic, the mental health of our Filipino Americans, Kauaians, is still at stake, namely our frontliner nurses, our frontliner doctors, healthcare workers, those who are quarantined and isolated at home, those who have lost their loved ones, those who have lost their jobs, and many more. The emotional anguish and trauma of our frontliners have been brought to the front line, to the forefront, I'm sorry, to brought to the forefront by the recent published death by suicide of an emergency room doctor from the New York Presbyterian Allen Hospital. It is because of the importance of mental health in this pandemic that we bring you this series. At this time, I will ask my co-organizers to say a few words. First, Dr. Marie Ortiz, the president of the Philippine Nurses Association of New York. Marie. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Ramel. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Filipino American Health Forum on COVID-19 Series 3. I'm Dr. Marie Ortiz, President of the Philippine Nurses Association of New York. The purpose of the association is to unite all the Filipino American nurses in the state of New York to promote the highest standards of professional quality practice, education, cultural advancement, and socioeconomic stability. The association participates actively in community activities that will enhance the purpose and objective of the association, such as connecting with the organizers of the health forum that serves to provide education on COVID-19 as a pandemic that has claimed so many lives. Education and research play a major role in what we do, imparting best practices and evidence-based science the people to live happy and healthy lives. Today's series will enhance your knowledge and awareness that of the effects of COVID-19 on mental health, which is a major concern affecting safety and general health. Health and well-being requires a sound mind and a healthy body. Knowing oneself, understanding one's feelings and emotions leads one to perform activities that are safe healthy, and productive. Now we have Dr. Emerson Ia, 
Chair of Kalusugan Coalition. Thank you very much, Dr. Ortiz. My name is Emerson Ia, and I'm the chair of Kalusugan Coalition. As a chair, as a community organization dedicated to advancing the health and well-being of Filipino Americans, and that includes mental health and well-being, Kalusugan Coalition is very proud to co-organize and co-host this health forum series on COVID-19. This pandemic has touched every one of us, and this health forum is our way to inform and empower the Filipino-American community by discussing topics that resonate with and address the needs of our community. We thank you for your participation, and we look forward to an engaging dialogue during a Q&A session. It is now my pleasure to pass the mic to Dr. Laura Garcia, the chair of the National Federation of Filipino-American Associations, NAFA New York chapter. Thank you, Dr. Emerson. Hi, my name is Laura Garcia. I am the state chair for the National Federation of Filipino American Associations of New York, or NAFA New York. NAFA's mission is to promote the welfare and well being of Filipino Americans throughout the United States. Some of our advocacies include promoting collaboration on issues affecting Filipino Americans in areas of education, health, civil rights, immigration, and many others. NAFA partners with local affiliate organizations and national coalitions for in advocating for issues of common concern. Health is a common concern, especially in our current environment of COVID-19. With you in mind, this PhilM Health Forum was designed. So welcome to the third of several series of Phil M Health Forum. Now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Angelico Razon. Dr. Razon is the committee chair or co-chair of the Council for Young Filipino American Physicians of the Association of Philippine Physicians of Amer in America. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Uh, good afternoon and mabuhay. My name is Angelica Rizan, or ECO for short. As one of the co-chairs of the Council for Young Filipino American Physicians, or CFAP, I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion and to help destigmatize mental health in our community. As a part of APPA, CFAP's vision is to unify the diverse lived experiences of Filipino American medical students, trainees, and physicians to be an effective change agent in tackling the community's most pressing health priorities. If the current public health situation has taught us anything, it's that we're in this together. And I hope that our conversation today will help us take care of ourselves and each other. Now, Dr. Rivera will introduce our first speaker. General in New York, the Ambassador Claro Cristobal, who is our partner and great supporter of the Filipino American Health Forum. Ambassador. Good afternoon again, my dear friends. And, and for the third time, we are uh, expressing our deepest gratitude to the organizers of this uh, health forum. Uh, the Association of Philippine Physicians in America, Kalusugan Coalition, the Philippine Nurses Association, New York chapter, and the National Federation of Filipino American Associations uh, in New York. The past uh, two iterations of this forum have been so very well received. And I thank you, my dear friends, so much for that. We don't stop receiving comments and we continue to see views of uh, previous uh, uh, iterations of the forum uh, expanding. And uh, we just uh, recently received a comment from uh, Paris, France. So we are reaching the world. And what they request uh, from us is, would you please kindly publish the very important presentations that were made during the forum. And so very soon, we will be uploading in our website 
all the presentations in addition to the Q and A's and the views, but the presentations themselves that were so lovingly and expertly prepared and presented by our uh, fantastic resource persons. That's their request and we're going to grant it through the website of the Philippine Consulate General. My dear friends, uh, you, you all are doing uh, great strides in reaching out and helping and assisting our people cope and cope more effectively with this uh, scourge. And my hope really is that uh, we continue uh, with great uh, fervor in uh, pursuing this uh, important uh, assistance that you have been extending to our people. In behalf of all of them, I thank you. At this time, uh, I'd like to call on Dr. Angelica Rozon for medical disclaimers and housekeeping rules. Hi, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping items uh, to help along with our conversation today. And I'm actually going to also be providing these in the chat box to give you a moment to also find the chat box um, if you're joining us on the Blue Jeans uh, website or app. So here they are now. Um, so just as a reminder, this event is being recorded so that it can be shared later with others not able to join the live event. You can check the chat box for the link to our YouTube channel and RSVP for the next event as well. When viewing virtual events, please be in a quiet room and mute your audio when you are not speaking so that others may enjoy the presentation. If you have uh, questions for Dr. Kagande after her initial presentation, please use the chat box on the side. Don't forget to introduce yourself uh, with your name and your state. Uh, one of our moderators will also be monitoring the chat box for questions and comments. Our goal for this series is to build community and share information. We are unable to comment on individual's risk factors or medical issues. If you or a loved one is having a medical concern, please seek attention from your healthcare provider. I've also provided the, the phone numbers for the disaster distress um, hotline, uh, as well as the national domestic violence hotline. This is an evolving phenomenon and every locality's public health situation is different. So please refer to cdc.gov, coronavirus.gov, and your local department or public health department for the most up-to-date information. Uh, Dr. Kagande will be reviewing several different resources in her presentation, but I've also included uh, some of these hotline numbers in the chat box to the side. Uh, now I'm going to return back to Dr. Rivera, who is going to continue with the rest of our program. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rezon. <clears throat> the organizers of the Health Forum bring you Filipino American excellence through the invited Filipino American experts to empower and advocate for our Filipino American community, because a very informed community is an empowered community. Today, we are very pleased to have a fellow psychiatrist, Dr. Consuelo Cagande, as our expert speaker on mental health. Dr. Cagande earned her degree in Bachelor of Arts from Rutgers University in New Jersey, and her medical degree from Cebu Institute of Medicine in Cebu, Philippines. She earned, she trained in general psychiatry at the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, Cooper University Hospital in Camden, New Jersey. She did a child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship at the Johns Hopkins University Hospital. She is an academic who has a residence, so was a, she was the residency training director for 12 years an associate professor of psychiatry, a psychiatry course director, a clerkship director, an invited speaker nationally and internationally, published articles, authored books, book chapters and edited textbooks on positive psychiatry, psychology, and psychotherapy. She is currently the division chair of community care and wellness and the Senior Associate Program Director and Fellowship Advisor in the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. Yay, Philadelphia, right? Up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Her main interests are mood disorders, 
anxiety disorders, trauma, integrated and collaborative ther uh, care, telepsychiatry, which uh, we are using right now, uh, and program development. Without further ado, Dr. Consuelo, uh, Consuelo Gagande will now present mental health in the midst of COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Rivera, and thank you to all the organizers. Um, it is truly an honor to be invited to speak um, about mental health in the midst of COVID-19. And thank you for taking an hour of your day on a Saturday. As mentioned, it's really beautiful here in the East Coast. And the nice thing about webinars is that you can be anywhere to listen. I was actually even thinking about doing this by the pool, but um, worried about Wi-Fi or getting wet. Um, so, this presentation is very timely, as May is Mental Health Awareness Month. I want to thank the Phil M. Forum organizers for picking mental health as a topic during this time, because there is no health without mental health. My objectives for uh, my presentation is really, uh, hopefully, for you to be able to discuss and be comfortable to discuss how COVID-19 pandemic impacts mental health. Learn how to mitigate worsening of mental health and be familiar with resources for support. We are in the midst of a disaster. This slide shows the categories of natural and human-made disasters. Before COVID-19, we were able to provide support by hugging each other, consoling each other in person, by gathering, especially with loved ones, during other disaster, disasters like 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina. No one was social or physically distancing at that, those times at this global scale. COVID-19, on the other hand, is happening simultaneously and at different stages throughout towns, cities, states, countries, regions. So it has prolonged that fear, anxiety, and isolation that impact mental health. The coronavirus has disrupted everyone's life. Social and physical distancing has canceled many milestones, dreams, and celebrations, especially graduations around this time. I like this slide and I credit it to Dr. Gabrielle Gar Carlson, who is the president of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the bowling concept. Basically, the coronavirus just came rolling down towards us and just like that, struck, as, struck us like a bowling ball and knocked off everything that was meaningful to us including things that sustained us, things that we were looking forward to, things that kept us living and giving us hope. Unemployment has been the highest in a long time due to COVID. It's even more palpable because everyone knows not only one, but maybe even a, a, handful, or a, whole, a handful of people or a whole team who lost their jobs from mandatory physical distancing and non-essential workers forced to stay home. One positive aspect of all this is that we are on this together. If any takeaway message is from this, is that. And we are adapting to what has commonly been known now as our new normal. In a disaster, the size of the psychological footprint greatly exceeds the size of the medical footprint. What does this mean? Dr. Joshua Morgenstein, a psychiatrist and captain of the US Public Health Service said, we are in a marathon not a sprint, but how long are we going to be running? It is very difficult to predict because there are different degrees the pandemic has affected, as I mentioned, within regions, countries, state, and town, due to different hotspots. Therefore, the impact on psychological and health factors will occur at different times, and thus prolonging the curve until it is crushed globally. What we do know is that it is better to focus and be aware that this is likely going to be a long lasting effect, especially those of us who are dealing with other issues around health disparities and inequities that cause the greatest barriers. So as poignant as these footprints are, we need to take it one step at a time because our mental health depends on it. And as I mentioned, there is no health without mental health. Based on past pandemics are unique responses to pandemics, fear and uncertainty, isolation, and quarantine to prevent spread, which compounds the feeling of loneliness, shortages and scarcity, medication, treatment, and as we know early on, hand sanitizers and toilet paper are basic needs. 
Misinformation rapidly spreads, especially now with fast social media and, quote unquote, fake news. There is going to be anger, stigma, and scapegoating. And I want to, I'm glad next week's session, um, talk is going to be about xenophobia. And I think that's very important to address during this time. Faltering confidence in government and institution, at times fueling political fight, which compound even more mistrust and fear. There's a surge in healthcare demand. But that can also decrease access to care for those not requiring immediate medical attention. Altered perception of risk causing maladaptive behaviors, such as avoiding going out when it can actually be done safely, and refusing to go to work, especially an essential worker. All these can further cause psychological and behavioral responses during pandemic disaster. And what are those responses? The Center for the Study of Traumatic Stress summarizes the major psychological and behavioral responses to disasters such as a pandemic. Please take note that some of these responses are normal, such as distress reactions. It's, norm it's normal to have sleep problems, especially if you have never had problems before. These are called worried well. There is going to be a decreased sense of safety and we are taking more precautions and being more mindful of washing hands, wearing masks, decontaminating when we get home. With fear and worries, we can get headaches, stomach aches. Some will be more irritable and angry, making them feel also that they are losing control. Feeling alone or can't focus on tasks because of worrying about what has been mentioned or even more. Again, these can be normal reaction and should not be pathologized. At some point, we all had some of these reactions when the pandemic uh, started. But some may worsen into maladaptive health risk behaviors, such as substance use or interpersonal conflict. Unfortunately, being home more places children and partners at more risk for violence. Please check on those you are concerned about. And as mentioned, there were resources that are being posted for such. Some are not able to integrate or balance work and life anymore. All these can impact or exacerbate pre-existing or comorbid physical conditions, such as hypertension, diabetes, and immune deficiency disorders, which all can pre exacerbate pre-existing mental illness. When such stress occurs, it can weaken your immune system and can make it more difficult to fight COVID-19 if infect infected. So it is important to take care of our immune system also by taking care of our mental health. We know COVID-19 affects the lungs. We know substance use disorders, drugs can weaken our immune system the biggest culprit is smoking, which already damages the lungs. This includes any inhaled substances, such as vaping. When you don't have a healthy lung, it can make it harder to fight the virus. Given the serious consequence of the infection, think about using this time to quit drugs, especially smoking and vaping. Bottom line, healthy lungs plus healthy immune system can help fight COVID-19. Healthcare providers and clinicians have been considered heroes. Underneath all the personal protective equipment, or PPE, there is a hero. But to frontliners, they will tell you, we are not heroes, we are just doing our job. We signed up for this. But then also some may say, no, we did not sign up for, th sign up for this. We were not trained. And it's true, unless you were trained in, and specialized in disaster medicine or disaster psychiatry, we were not prepared for this and I hope disaster preparedness will be included in the curriculum. Now, underneath all that PPE, if you will, is also a sense of vulnerability and the amount of stress that is constant 24 seven can take a toll. The severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2 is a scary disease that makes a small but significant percentage of people who acquire it very sick. As we all know, frontline workers are at higher risk than the general population of contracting COVID-19. PPE is in short supply, forcing us to change the way we approach infection control. The pace of change is much more rapid than usual during this time, and change can be hard. Many of us in medicine are fixers. We want to solve problems. We want to help. We took the oath of do no harm. There's a sense of helplessness. Also, I wanted just to point out certain terms that we should also pay attention and look for. Survivor guilt, feelings of guilt at having surviving a traumatic situation when others did not can occur. Negative moral stress, distress, sorry, 
is a negative self-directed emotion or attitude that arise when one is involved in a situation that is at odds with one's morality. For instance, there was an article recently that I saw and in institutions and hospitals have to come up with guidelines or protocols in order to, to decide who gets treatment. Secondary trauma is a distress that comes about as a result of bearing witness to the trauma of others. It, can, it is an occupational hazard for some line of work and it is real. More important than ever, we have to protect against short-term and long-term negative effects on physical and mental health. One of the most important things to remember, though, is that every person is having a different experience of this crisis. Different responsibilities at home and at work, different thresholds and triggers for anxiety, different comfort levels with new processes, different ways of expressing emotion. So how do we mitigate our anxiety and fears from getting worse? It's important to do self-care. Self-care basically means taking care of your own basic needs, and each one of us have different needs with respect to self-care. We are used to taking care of others, but like the oxygen mask theory, you have to put the mask on first before putting the mask on someone else. And what are these basic needs for self-care? They are our top health priorities. Our body needs good nutrition, including water. Our body needs adequate physical activity, you know, working at home, being on virtual meetings all day, hopefully today you're only one hour. <laughs> so schedule a physical activity daily. Exercise. We see videos of people doing marathon in their backyards. A British man walked up and down his driveway 100 times for his 100th birthday during this COVID crisis. If he can do that, the rest of us can. Adequate sleep. Can't emphasize enough. If we do not get enough sleep, we will be more irritable, more anxious, and not able to function and care for others. Avoid, again, excessive use of alcohol and nicotine. Avoid illicit drugs completely as a means of coping. And I want to add, just because salons are closed does not mean you can't take care of your skin or feet or even back care or even hair. I'm seeing pictures of nice um, haircuts. Positivity, self-compassion, and resilience are also important to nurture. Communication can be an antidote for distress. Choosing less negative but more neutral positive words can make a difference, such as concern instead of panic, being prepared instead of hoarding, and I can instead of I can't. Celebrate the wins, those milestones, even if not in gatherings. Make time for it. Being kind to yourself, having self-compassion is very important. Don't be too hard on yourself that you're not able to help your child with their homework or juggle work at home and kids. Give yourself a break. There, there are primary expressions of self-compassion also, such as social connectedness. Reach out to others as an expression of kindness. There's so many organizations now reaching out and donating. This is another resource I wanted to share. Although it says it is for healthcare provider, it really is for everyone. I already talked about some of these and will be talking about them, but two things that I want to point out that I'm not talking about specifically is promote teamwork and flexibility is key. I will make these slides available if you, um, if you care to as well for the specific uh, resources. We need to treat our brain like we treat an engine of a car, right? It needs fuel like oxygen. We need to remember to just stop and take deep breaths. We also have to be mindful while taking those breaths, especially. What is mindfulness? According to Oxford Dictionary, mindfulness is a mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment while calmly acknowledging and accepting one's feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations. Basically, empty your mind and pay attention to the present and what your body is telling you not what about what may happen or what just happened because there is only so much we can control. One of the feelings that is normal in times of a disaster or stress is losing control. This slide is really worthwhile looking at and reading through. I give credit to a CHOP colleague, Melissa Xanthopoulos. Learning to let go is one of the principles or pillars of mindfulness. It can be followed by the pillar of acceptance. 
accepting that you have no control over certain things, but you have control over other certain things. You have control of your own reactions and your behavior. It's your choice. Um, some of these are already um, I discussed, but one I want to point out is my gratitude. I actually want to take a few sec seconds right now to pause and invite you to a little, very brief mini mindfulness exercise. One is to think of something right now about what you are grateful for, or just take that deep breath and pay attention to what is happening around you, or that air going through your nose to, down to your lungs while you're breathing. Okay, good. Thank you. This is a more in-depth self-assessment on how one would want to battle this new norm and not let it get the best out of us and can be done while doing mindfulness. I like this because it helps us go through stages like one way one may go through stages of grief. And again, all of this is normal, completely normal and should not be pathologized. If you notice that you are persistently in the fear zone, it may be time to pause and prioritize self-care. Again, I'll make these slides available. Children. Children are fully aware of the disruption and can also develop emotional and behavioral issues. Anxiety or fear is the most common emotional problem in children. If not addressed, it can turn into sadness or depression. If you have an anxious child or teenager, ask. The culture of, quote, if we ask it, it will make it worse or plant a bad seed of emotion will really miss something that can turn into a bad outcome. Anxiety in children can be expressed differently. They'll ask many questions. They'll ask for a lot of reassurance. Is Lolo and Lola okay? Are we gonna be okay? Separation anxiety can start or worsen. They're reluctant to separate from parents. They don't want them to go to work. Physical symptoms like headaches or stomach aches can manifest. They become moody or irritable. Tantrums and meltdowns escalate, and again, trouble sleeping. So how do we respond as adults to help children from being anxious and control their anxiety and promote resilience during this time? Ask and listen to what they're saying, their concerns, their feeling. Simply ask, but be specific, not vague with your question, and allow emotional expression. If you're going to be vague, you'll get a vague answer. Instead of asking, how was your day, well, where they will just answer, okay, which really does not tell you much. Instead, ask, yesterday you were worried. How are you today? Were you able to concentrate on your homework, or did you have a good day today? So specific. For kids who have difficulty describing their feelings, use a feeling chart. Encourage coping skills like mindfulness. Make a coping toolbox. All the things that um, make them happy or calm them down. Although reassurance that they are safe helps, you don't want to overdo it because then they will continue to rely on you more and you might not be able to, and that worsens their anxiety. Create a shared understanding about what your family can do to be safe. You know, coronavirus is a germ that spreads between people, so we have to wash our hands often. Reinforce coping skills and mindfulness. Establish structure to their day. Provide a sense of normalcy. They're so used to routines and schedules at schools. Include physical activity, exercise in that schedule. Model calmness. Once you've learned mindfulness, you should be able to model that too. Dealing with your own anxiety as parent or adult can be the most powerful way to make sure your kids feel secure and understand what COVID-19 is. Model self-care. Cook together, healthy meals, exercise or do activities together. Promote the child's strength. Look for that silver lining. Look for the positive. Families for the first time are together, playing board games, being creative together. Share that other families are together and some of for the first time in months, laughing together and even doing TikTok together. You know, as bad as social media may get, right now it is being used in a positive way where we see families and friends doing fun things, sharing creative out ways to cope. 
Many Filipino households have multi-generation members. With your Lola or Lolo, have a discussion about how they overcame adversity in the past. We can learn so much from them. Most are lucky to have them still around, and this is a time to take advantage of that. But those who are not in the same home, we need to also reach out to them, to any elders. Ask them how their day was, because you know what? They worry too. They have fears about going outside also because of risk factors. And I'm sure before COVID-19, they all have a smartphone or some type of technology that we can't easily remotely um, connect with them. Notice that when you turn the TV on, there are more breaking news than ever before. Being home tempts keeping the TV and social media through the internet on, on constantly. Use the media wisely. Only watch if you need to for informed decisions. We all need to take a media break. Be cautious because being home all day with media on constantly in the background can be distressing to children or even us. So the pros and cons of the media or the yin and yang of the media can enhance dissemination of timely and accurate information, but it can also transmit fear and distress. Lastly, we must not give hope. Promoting hope promotes resilience as well, but it is a delicate balance. Challenges are real. Problems need to be managed. Losses to be counted. Pain is real and needs to be felt. Grief to be honored. This will eventually end. The curve has flattened in other countries. It is starting to flatten here in the US. We are starting to talk about opening, but safely and cautiously, of course. The we, most of us will do well, recognize and amplify the good, seek opportunities, maintain hope in the future. The foundation, the base, the wedge that holds us together is community. And our Filipino community is one of the strongest. So some take home points. It's normal to feel scared and anxious. Be calm, take care of yourself. Use mindfulness. It's okay to ask for help. Don't lose hope. And we are in this together. So um, as mentioned, I'm sorry, I didn't have that uh, slide up. Um, leave that there for a minute that I mentioned. And as I mentioned, um, or was mentioned as well, there are hotlines and resources that you can use um, or even offer or uh, share when you feel someone is in need. And these are some of them, especially the suicide prevention hotline. There is an international association for suicide prevention, which also provides uh, crisis uh, centers or resources um, that, um, especially if you're abroad. Filipinos are one of the most resilient people and are all over the world working, especially in the healthcare, caregiver, and environmental service fields. We can help others also by promote, promoting that resiliency. Lastly, salamat, thank you to all of those caring for patients during this time. You are not alone, may God bless you. And thank you to the organizers. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kagande, for an excellent, excellent presentation. Um, babuhay si Dr. Kagande. <laughs> um, Thank you. So, <laughs> you're welcome. Um, now we go to the question and answer section of the presentation. First, I want to ask, uh, I want to ask the, um, the uh, organizers uh, to be the first to pose their questions. Uh, uh, Marie from PNA, uh, please ask your question. Thank you, Dr. Romel. Thank you, Dr. Kagande, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is, in the adjustment phase of a psychological stressor from COVID-19, how can an individual quickly and smoothly transition from the stage of fear to the, st to the growth stage? Uh, can one's effective immunity play a part in this adjustment? 
Yes. I mean, again, you know, with um, anyone who has underlying physical health, it can also affect mental health and vice versa. Uh, so it is important to take care of ourselves, um, both physically and mentally. Um, and as I mentioned, in terms of how to, you know, all those examples of, of self-care. All right. Um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for your question. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kagande. Thank you, Marie. Uh, now, a question from uh, Laura uh, Emerson, Dr. Emerson Ia from Co uh, Kalusugan Coalition. Thank you, Dr. Kagande, for um, that very calming presentation for really providing facts and what we can do. And self-care is such an important component of this. Um, my question relates to the long-term effects of this. Although the immediate mental health effect of this current pandemic is tremendous, we all know based on previous experience and disasters that the long-term sequela is a lot worse. So do you have any recommendations for organizations, especially healthcare organizations, what can they do to anticipate and really mitigate the long-term sequelae, mental health sequelae of this pandemic? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Emerson. Um, excellent question, and I thank you for that. Um, so yeah, yeah, you know, I think one of the things that we have to really promote as a community and organization is resiliency and promoting, again, self-care, uh, providing support, um, you know, such as this, you know, awareness. This is a this is a perfect month to bring this all about in terms of awareness about mental health. People might think that there's nothing wrong with them, but there may be, and that can have an impact in terms of long-term consequence because they're not paying attention or they're not aware that everything is actually not not right. So all those examples of self-care, um, promoting positivity. Um, really, again, can uh, promote resilience, especially in children starting now. Um, and for adults who have predisposing, whether it's genetic predisposition, um, you know, family history, or currently or, um, had pre-COVID um, mental illness already that was stable, and this can worsen. And, you know, we need to pay attention to that and be supportive. And it's okay to ask and talk about it. Um, in terms of long-term effects such as PTSD, especially for the frontliners, again, paying attention to our body and, and mind and just doing self-care in the midst of um, the crisis, you know, taking breaks, providing nourishment, um, reaching out, organizations, volunteering to, to provide food um, and resources and just showing their appreciation, you know, through media, through all these drive-throughs by the hospitals, um, can give them a sense of, um, you know, purpose and meaning. And I think that's another huge basic need that we need as humans, that sense of purpose. Um, so there are people who are at higher risk for developing PTSD no matter what you do. But again, that's important to be educated and teach them on what to look for and to, it's okay to ask for help. They won't ask for help sometimes, so that sometimes we have to be the ones to ask them and how they're doing or how, you know, how their day is going. If there's anything I can do for you, this must be so tough. Empathy is huge, goes far as a, 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 a hundred miles away. So I think we need to, to pay attention to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a question from uh, Dr. Laura Garcia. Hi, yes. Um, thank you, Dr. Kagande, for that wonderful and excellent presentation. And I am glad that you had mentioned our um, family activities with our children and um, our teens, especially our teens. Because as we know, when our children grow into teenagers, it becomes more challenging for us to know what they're thinking and they're feeling. Those acti activities are really wonderful. But there will always, there will be times, because teen teenagers will always be teenagers. So when do the normal ups and downs of adolescence become something to worry about? Yeah, great question. Thank you, um, Laura. Um, again, it, it might be hard Usually, if you know, if they're at school and they're at kids, academics are, are usually can be impacted if there's 
um, you know, their depression or their anxiety is really worse, it can become debilitating. And being at home might not be uh, <laughs> as easy to look for that because, you know, sometimes maybe schools are not as strict or with their grades giving that there's added stress already. Um, but again, I think I, I, I mentioned in terms of um, asking them how they're doing more specifically, you know, the, how to ha discuss openly what, what they think about the situation. Um, more irritability, um, more risky behaviors. I mean, fortunately, sometimes being at home protects them from that, you know, going out and, and not knowing what they're doing and you can't monitor them um, if they're out, but you can monitor them more wh while they're at home. So, you know, you should at least spend more time with them uh, more. Um, and this is the opportunity to do that. Um, talk about each other's feelings, model calmness, model, um, you know, uh, uh, open um, expression of your emotions. Um, so I think promoting a lot of the resiliency, doing things together. If I think one thing that you might be able to uh, pay attention to is that, you know, for a while they wanted to be together, but all of a sudden, no, they just want to stay in their room. Um, those Any sudden changes, I would really explore a little bit more in terms of, hey, you know, we used to want to do this. Of course, it gets boring. Obviously, we're all bored now staying home, but just having that open discussion, um, hey, you know, for the whole week, you just didn't want to be with us anymore. You know, let me know if there's anything going on and or let's talk about it. Or is there something you want to talk about? Hope that answers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, how about uh, a question from uh, Dr. Uh, Razon? Thank you so much, Dr. Gagande, for creating a space um, for mindfulness and reflection um, this weekend. Um, as you pointed out, close-knit intergenerational ties are such an important part of um, our culture. And at these forums, we've had a wide range of ages. Today, the youngest is 23 and the oldest is 83. Um, some people may have had a previous traumatic experience while others may have not. And so as people at different ages or stages of life may manifest, cope with, and approach emotional distress differently, what can we do as individuals or as a community do to recognize and talk about trauma and other mental health concerns with younger and older Filipino Americans? Yeah, uh, great question. Um... You know, I'm sure there's a lot of good answers, but one thing that I could probably really think about is, I think the advantage of this, again, is, you know, especially um, reaching out to elders and or having elders in the home is to openly just talk about it. I don't think there's any difference in terms of age range, other than if they're young and, and you know, child who might not necessarily understand, you have to be very concrete about the situation. Um, I think, if I understand also your question um, correctly, is that just being open, um, reassure, um, listen, just listen to what each other are saying, and um, you know, just give that sense of, you know, we're here to talk about it, we're here to um, share each other's experience, and like I mentioned, I think it's a great advantage to even talk to our lolas and lolas about you know, those who have lived through World War II, um, through other disasters, um, you know, in the Philippines especially, um, and here in the U.S., you know, what they do to calm themselves, what, um, and, you know, the younger generation can teach, you know, this is an opportunity to teach the um, wiser or, uh, generations, I don't want to say older, <laughs> wiser generations, mm -hmm. you know, some games, teach them technology, you know, they uh, play games online together. Um, so I think that sense of, again, community, openness, sharing thoughts, sharing their feelings, um, regardless of how, a, how old they are, I think is, is important. No, <clears throat> no thank you. Uh, <clears throat> do you have any questions from the audience, uh, Emerson? I don't see any questions on chat. I just saw a, um, um, a message from one of the participants thanking Dr. Kagande for her presentation. All right, thank you. Um, I just want to mention also um, in terms of Filipino, Filipino traits, uh, 
like Bayanihan, Kapwa, and Tayo, or Filipino, innate Filipino traits that also could help us uh, fight the pandemic. Uh, they're innate in us, our um, Bayanihan spirit, our sense of being a community, Tayo meaning we uh, as Filipino Americans, as Filipinos, and Kapwa, a sense of shared identity as Filipino Americans would help us through this, uh, uh, this pandemic. Um, so um, I don't know if there are other uh, questions from Marie uh, or uh, Emerson. Do you have a second question, Marie? Or Emerson or uh, Laura? My question uh, is actually, um, I know that some families have a family member with a behavioral problem. And with this anxiety that's being magnified because of COVID-19 pandemic, how can they handle uh, a, that family member with a behavioral problem if it just gets uh, too much to the point that that member is acting up? Is there any help that they can get, let's say, in the middle of the night? Sorry. I think it, it should not be any different than when, what it was in terms of pre-COVID. You know, um, I know hospitals are, are, are not the best place to go to sometimes, but when in crisis, they need to really uh, call 911 um, or take them to the emergency room if they can. Um, so I would really, um, you know, do that for the safety of the, the family member, but as well as those uh, at home. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Emerson, or do um, you have any question? Yes, Dr. Kagandi, I have a question that yeah. really relates to the stigma of mental health illness um, among the Filipino community. So I'd like to ask you that when would it be appropriate for family members, you know, for people we work with, we live with to seek help if a family member or someone we know um, has been demonstrating behaviors um, that could lead to, um, could be detrimental to their health. Yeah, no, great question, right. And, and you know, fully aware of, of the, the stigma and, you know, there's still a lot of stigma. I mean, even here in the US, not just in the Philippines, but. I think it's important to, um, you know, discuss um, and reach out to, I mean, it's also case-based. Uh, it depends on the case, um, you know, the individual, how close you are to that person to really uh, speak to them, um, you know, notice that you, things are not right or, or something like that. I mean, as coworkers too, we should also identify or be um, mindful again of you know your co-workers who are seem to be struggling um, you know teenagers uh, friends you know I, I you know I'm very open with my kids to talk about their their mental health as well as friends and um, what they can do to help their friends um, so I think that's very important and you know generational you know I think our the generations now are are more attuned to mental health and you know the stigma is still there, but it's getting better. So that's that's um, one nice thing. Um, you know, I'm a Boomer X uh, generation, a kind of a combination of a Boomer and a Generation X. Um, but I'm also in tune to the the X Y Zs. I guess being a child psychiatrist helps, so because I, I I need to be up to date. Um, but I think um, it's really important and and talk to parents, educate the parents, educate um, the community. Um, you know, suicide is, is such is such a debilitating or, you know, to everybody. So I think to prevent that and again, using this month to um, promote mental health awareness and it's that it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to talk about your feelings um, because that's one thing that we really have to change. Um, you know, we were told to suck it up. It's all in your brain and your mind. Yeah, of course it's in your brain and your mind, but we have to take care of that, your brain and your mind. We have one question from our uh, chat participant, Dr. Sager. I can read it. Um, there is a Filipino trait of bearing suffering quietly, right? Have you seen that as a risk for being able to talk about feelings and maintaining um, mental health? Yes, uh, exactly. I think I was just saying that in terms of, you know, some people will hold things in and there's that 
feeling of shame, feeling of embarrassed. Um, you know, sometimes some people are looked at as the patriarch or the matriarch or the strong one, or you're always good, you're so smart, you're so successful. And again, like a hero, our frontliners, we looked up to them, right? Because they're the ones taking care of people. They were trained to take care of people. We're, they're problem fixers. We go to them to seek for medical help, for advice. But they're so vulnerable as well, right? They put up that front, they put up that face, they put on that cape to disguise all that, you know, because they're considered heroes. But again, they don't consider them heroes. So there is that, there is that risk. And, and thanks for bringing that up. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, uh, end the question and answer section now. Thank you, uh, everybody who participated in the question and answer. Thank you, Dr. Kagande. Excellent answers to the question. Thank uh, you. Before we end, uh, we want to have some remarks from the Consul General, Ambassador uh, Claro Cristobal again, before we end. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cagante. In fact, the Facebook page of the consulate has been uh, receiving comments and uh, two questions unrelated to today's topic. The comments mostly are to thank Dr. Cagante for the great presentation, as well as the organizers for uh, uh, mounting this most important forum. The two questions that were raised through our FB page are the following. When do we reopen? And number two, how is the quarantine process in Manila? Let me answer them very quickly. We reopen as soon as the city and the state of New York allow us to do so. In other words, there is an unpause. You, you know, New York has this pause uh, uh, executive order. Once it is lifted, at least partially, the consulate will reopen. Two, all arriving passengers in the Philippines will be vetted uh, through a system of tests and evaluation, triage of symptoms, all. But who can dare to fly to the Philippines now? Only Filipino nationals. What is the proof of Filipino nationality? Passport. So if you don't have a Philippine passport, you may not be admitted at all flown back to where you came from at the very airport. But if you are a foreign national, in other words, a, a holder of a non-Philippine passport, you may be admitted on two grounds. You are a diplomat or an agent of a foreign government accredited to Manila you will be admitted. Or you are a foreign national married to a Philippine citizen. You're part of the family in the Philippines. If you don't belong to either category, don't even try. If you are a U.S. passport holder uh, and your wife is with you in the U.S. or your husband with you in the U.S., don't try. You may not be admitted. Everyone will go through the quarantine process. If you are showing symptoms or not showing sy symptoms, you will be vetted through a triage. And those with symptoms or through the rapid test are found to be positive, immediate, restrictive, stringent quarantine, they call it. But if you are not symptomatic or you are tested and found negative, you will be allowed to leave the airport, in other words, 
admitted into the country, but mandated to home quarantine. So, if you are leaving the US or any other part of the world for the Philippines, and you will be there for one week or just two weeks, better not go because you will just be on quarantine, either at a facility or at home quarantine. Now, let me conclude uh, uh, my remarks. Dr. Cagante mentioned something and it's, it, it struck me as, uh, as uh, one very reason why the consulate is so appreciative of this great help forum. She said, community is at the very base for helping, assisting our people. And the Filipino community here is one such important resource. Let me tell you this. Of the 82 Filipino Americans who have so far died and been reported to us, several of them lived alone. And because of that, they died alone. It's the Philippine community, it's the Filipino in us who could reach out to those among us who live alone. And if we need mental health, we need to boost our mental resiliency in the midst of this crisis, so they do. And my hope is that our community can, can care enough to bring our community strengths to bear particularly for those people who live. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Gagante, Dr. Uh, Rivera, and all our great audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. Um, uh, thank you for those announcements, and, and thank you for that advice uh, for the Philippine-American community. Um, now we go to the... Um, uh, Part of the closing remarks, uh, uh, Marie, I will now uh, announce uh, the next uh, session. Marie. Yeah, thank you, uh, Consul General Cristobal. Thank you, Dr. Kagande, for the wonderful uh, presentation and to all my co-organizers and attendees. Our next uh, series will be Xenophobia and Racism Amidst COVID-19, which will be shown on, presented rather on May 9. And there are other topics that we will be deciding to present depending on solicitation from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. And now to close this session, uh, Dr. Laura Garcia. Thank you all for joining our third of several series of Phil Am Health Forum. Got feedback? We would love to hear from you. Please send us your comments, suggestions on how we can improve our forum and most importantly, future, future topics that you would like us to present. And please email us at phil.am.health.forum at gmail.com and follow us at hashtag philamhealthcovid19. Thank you and see you next time. Be safe and be well.